Good morning, everybody. We're going to finish up our study of Romanesque art today, which I'm actually sort of sorry to leave it. And I could spend a whole semester with the Romanesque period. I think because it's such a seminal period. And when we move into the Gothic period in the next series, which will end this semester, you'll see that things suddenly start to change. It's like in the Romanesque period, we're just on the edge of a complete change in Western civilization and it flowers into the 14th and 15th and then up. We suddenly start moving almost into a modern age, even in the 15th century, I think, but you can decide what you think. And I've actually, starting with this lecture, and I'm gonna put more of them in the Gothic lectures. I'm putting some links to some medieval sites. I think it's really worth looking at the history. And there's so many more things to look at besides the few things that I give you to look at in these lectures. I mean, this is a survey course. And of course, that's the trouble that I always have is for every one little tiny thing I show you, there's a hundred examples. And if I showed them all to you, you would be able to put my lecture on and then drive to Massachusetts from Tennessee and still be listening about Romanesque sculpture. But I am digressing, so let's get started. And in this lecture, we're gonna start in the North Sea Kingdoms. And it's interesting because the time period is the same, but like our study of early medieval art, we have a very different flavor of architecture and style here, and you'll easily see the roots of it. But it's important to look at it now because these people are the people that are invading and these people are the people that will have a great influence on Normandy and in the Normans, and then of course into England. So we find these new alliances happening, which is going to begin to change the European language, landscape. Language too, but I meant to say landscape. Anyway, the North Sea became a Viking waterway back in the ninth century. And we've already, we, we do talk, touch on this. And the Vikings seized Normandy in 911, which is interesting <laughs> date. And within a century, it became one of the most powerful kingdoms in Europe. So the Normans made a very close alliance with the church. They gained the allegiance of the church. And that, again, is always a recipe to power, as we've seen. In 1066, the Duke of Normandy invades England. He replaces the Anglo-Saxon nobility there. And England gets allied with northern France. So I'm starting with the North Sea Kingdoms because that is the trajectory of these people. But I want to go back to Norway now, and we're going to see these wooden stave churches, which the in, in Norway and these Northern Kingdoms is the only place we find these. And we see sort of some Romanesque style, but they're made all out of wood. So it's, it's very different because they're not making these stone arches. And we also see Celtic art in architecture. And I've given you a link on this slide to information about, about a stave church at Urns because it's a World Heritage Site. So they're made out of timbers. And so just to refresh your memory, here's some different ways that over the centuries that people have worked with wood. But these churches, they use these things, they're called crooks. And a crook is actually a pair of timbers that are made right by splitting a forked tree. So they're used for roof supports and wall support. So they had, of course, old growth forest. And you know we can't even imagine what the landscape would have been like you know, a couple of thousand years ago, 1500 years ago, with the kinds of trees that they had to work with. And then of course now, wood will decay plus fire. Most of the timber buildings from this period have disappeared. So we can only imagine from these few examples what their towns and cities or landscapes might have looked like. And they finished the outsides of the buildings with what's called wattle and daub wall. 
So I've got some little diagrams over here on the side. You can see, for instance, a horizontal log construction, post and lintel crook construction. And then when you get to the stave church, we see this cutaway of a Borgen stave church. You see that it has, as the Romanesque churches farther to the south do, a nave with side aisles, but because it's built out of wood with this crook construction, it's got a very different flavor when you see the church. The outside show, sort of shows you the structure of the inside. So here it is, and there's several of these stave churches that did survive in Norway. And so there's other posts inside the corner stave. So that's how they create the nave and side aisles in these. And then there's gables, there's crosses and dragons, which protect the church and the congregation. So the staves are four large timbers that make the core of the building. And I've linked you to a YouTube video here. If you like, you can go on this and you can sort of walk through the inside of a stave church. And when you click on that one, you'll find many, many other ones. They're a very popular site if you'd like to travel. So of course I only have, you know, not much example for the artwork, but this is a really nice example. This is from the Urns Church, um, which was made around 1050. And so this little example is just shows you what the whole facades of these churches, they're covered with this animal interlacing with serpentine creatures. They're snapping each other and, and, um, if you think back to this animal interlace style that we saw in early Celtic manuscripts like the Book of Kells, it's easy to see the influence. Now, another thing that's interesting is these churches were built right around the time of the Black Plague in Norway. So, the you know, the Black Plague started earlier and it went like a wildfire throughout Europe. And so everywhere it hit, it decimates the population exponentially. So of course that halted the building of these churches and you know all sorts of other socio-cultural ramifications as well. So now I would like to talk to you about the Normans. And as we sort of sketched out in the beginning, in the mid 11th century, we have this new force coming into the European landscape who come from Normandy, that's why they're called Normans, in northern France. And again, they're descended from the Vikings, who really they began to gain power in the Carolingian period. So again, history, it's not like these things happen all at once. There'll be a long period of time where groups of people gain power, and then when they have enough power or motivation or in whatever other reasons that groups have to invade other areas, that is when we begin to see their effects. So in 1053, we have William the Conqueror. He gets the title of the Duke of Normandy after his father died, who his father was named Robert the Devil. And he died in Jerusalem. William was educated by a clergyman who was very smart and knew, again, this maxim that church and state together are more powerful than each alone. So in the year 1066, William, who is now a champion of Christianity, invaded England. He had 400 ships, and he wanted to claim the throne of England after Edward the Confessor died. William claimed that Harold had usurped the throne and that the throne really belonged to him. And so it's a very, very complicated history, and it's another thing you can look up about the Battle of Hastings, but it's... The battle itself, the battle at Hastings, are recorded on a very interesting artwork. It's called the Bayou Tapestry. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of a history because it's a lot easier to understand this artwork if you have it. So it's really, it's very unusual because it's executed in cloth. Now, it's called a tapestry, but for any of you who are textile people out there, the, as I am, you will know by seeing it that it is embroidery, which means it's not true tapestry. True tapestry is done by 
a weft interwoven with crosswise with crossing warp threads, and then the weft threads cover the warp threads completely done in different colors to create pictures. This piece is done in embroidery, which means there's a backing, and then the colored thread is sewn onto it in different configurations to create the figures. Scholars think that William's half-brother Odo, who was the Bishop of Bayou, commissioned it. And again, technically it's not a true tapestry because it's embroidered. Here, we're seeing servants preparing a feast and Bishop Odo blessing the food. The whole narrative, this is a big, long thing. It goes all the way around a very large room. And it tells the story of the Norman victory. And it's really, it's a propaganda work. It's meant to justify William's right to the throne of England. Is that throne, again, after Edward died, was competed for by three different people. So I've got a couple other images of it because it's just so interesting. This is a detail of the previous slide. And just look at the details. We see here they're being handed some meat on a stick. We've got a musician playing some kind of a horn. And we've got die, we've got this curved table. Odo is seated at the center. He's giving the blessing. And of course, William is seated at his right. We see the servants carrying things and all sorts of strange animals and beasts and griffins all along the edges. So the whole thing is 230 feet long, and it's only 20 inches high. So it's a long, like a long ribbon. They used eight colors of wool, and it's really, it validates his claim. And there's so many different depictions of Anglo-Saxon culture here. You can see their armor. You can see the horses' trappings. You can see what kinds of weapons they had. And it's just full of detail. There's also pictures with constructions of ships, preparations for battle. So imagine it's like a film strip. It's, you read it along, like a, from left to right, and the borders are all full of strange figures. There's even some erotic figures in them. You can see the, them up on the upper right. So it's a very interesting document if you go online and find all the pictures of it. It's not using the kind of details of classical painting, like modeling, foreshortening, some of these things we've learned about, but it's, it's almost cartoon-like in a way. It's a very detailed account. And each figure is totally individual. For example, there's a soldier who's fallen from a horse. The horse's hind legs are up in the air. And then he's very busy pulling down the other horse. You can see he's pulling on the reins. So, so it's, it's, we can immerse ourselves in this battle. So we've looked at the wooden stave churches, but the British turned from timber architecture to stone and brick because they associated masonry with the power and glory of ancient Rome. And they used it for castles, they used it for monasteries, they used it for churches. So we have two very early examples in northeastern England of Durham Castle and Durham Cathedral. Durham became a fortified complex with a castle, a monastery, and a cathedral starting around 1075 to 1100. And it's, it's a, also a World Heritage Site, and you can find all kinds of images and history on it, but we're going to concentrate on the Romanesque part. But sort of as a background, we have this Church of Saint-Étienne, which is in Normandy in France, and this church was begun in 1064. So this church is like Carolingian churches with a very minimum of decoration. We have big, huge, four buttresses. They're dividing the front of the church. So these four dividers, these are buttresses, which are, you'll see more buttresses in Gothic architecture. They're dividing it into three vertical sections. This thrust continues in these two towers. And so this is a precursor to Gothic architecture as well. So it was begun a century before Durham. So I'm wanting you to see sort of both sides from Normandy to England and what's happening on either side. Because William the Conqueror, he was a builder and he was involved in building this church. So he founded the monastery. He constructed this church while he was conquering England. And there was an abbey for women here. This church 
actually survived the devastation of Normandy in World War II, so it's amazing. So again, William founded two monastic communities, and this two-towered facade, this is a Norman invention, and this invention will be carried over for the next couple of centuries. Very simple, massive block walls, this tripartite articulated parts, tripartite division, these are all things we're going to see in Gothic architecture. But this is a Romanesque church. Here's the inside, and it was a three-part elevation with very wide arches in the nave arcade with a gallery up above it repeated. And then at the clear story, we have a third arcade with a passageway up there. And then we have alternating columns, dark light, heavy light. So it's this rhythm, rhythm. And we've seen this rhythm before, this heavy light, heavy light rhythm. And the emphasis, of course, is longitudinal, is up toward the front, up toward the apse. Here is a diagram, and this church, it originally had a timber roof. In 1120, they replaced it with a masonry vault. The Normans are trying to get height, and so they're this multi-part division of ribs in these ribbed vaults is one way that they're beginning to gain that. And this is, again, preparing the way for Gothic cathedrals of the 12th and 13th century. So it's this is the system Gothic builders adopted in the Ile de France, people like um, Abbot Suger. So here's what it looks like inside. So if you will, putting flesh on the bones of the diagram in the previous slide. Very, very simple interior, also three-part division. And so when you look at the Gothic churches, you're going to say, oh my goodness, these look alike. But they don't. The Gothic churches are taller. Of course, they're full of stained glass. There's much more light let in. And the way the division is done is different as well. So we have this we have here these engaged columns, diagonal ribs on the vaults. So it's a Romanesque church, but it's less heavy. It's almost light and airy. It's beginning to use line. So here is an exterior view of Durham Cathedral. Um, this photograph was taken around 1865. I actually found this photograph on Art Store. If you go on Art Store, you can find a lot of great pictures of Durham. And I've given you a link here to the World Heritage Site of Durham Cathedral, because if you're interested in this cathedral, you can find a lot of information there. And so this was built in 1093. But I love that this is an old photograph, because this gives us an idea what this church looked like in before the 20th century, right at the very end of the 19th century. So what it looked like about 120 or 30 years ago. So here is the nave. So this is considered to be the masterpiece of English Romanesque architecture. You can see similarities, of course, to the Church of Saint Etienne. And so now you see why I showed you that church first. The cathedral was very strategically located because it was right on the border with Scotland. So it was a military headquarters as well as an ecclesiastical one. And it's also a really great example of Norman stonework. If you notice the decoration on the columns, these chevrons, these are all intrinsically part of the columns that they use these different colored stones. And the Normans were experts at that. So I find it very interesting that the decoration is part of the form of the building itself rather than pictorial or applied on. The original apse was replaced by a Gothic choir around 1242 or 1280. So this is why you do see some Gothic elements in it, but it was begun in 1087. The vaulting was begun in 1093. So it's, it's like everything else. It's 
like having a palimpsest or, or a manuscript or a diagram of steps that these architects took as they developed these systems of architectures. And again, another hallmark of the Romanesque, we have these compound piers alternating with columns, columns decorated with all these different chevrons, the fluting diamond patterns. And the rib vaulting was fully developed at Durham, and it's the earliest systematic use of these ribbed groin vaults over a three-story nave, which, again, will receive its culmination in the Gothic period. So we have to have the plan. So here's the plan. So we no longer have these barrel vaults that we've seen in earlier Romanesque churches. Now we have these ribbed groin vaults with transverse arches. So the straight lines in this diagram are the arches. We'll go back and see. Do you see? Right here along this nave, you can see an arch, then a groin vault, then an arch, then a groin vault. So again, it's like a stepping stone. So the ribs are springing diagonally from the pier, so we have a seven-part division in each unit. So when we get these later additions, it truly becomes a blending of Romanesque and Gothic styles. And after we look at Gothic art, if you go back and look at this, you'll be able to see this even more clearly. Right now, you have to take my word for it because we haven't studied Gothic art yet. So here is a plan and the section. So again, the plan is our bird's eye view. We're standing above looking down. But the section, you can see now, here is this transverse section. And you can see this, this buttressing um, here on the outside and the side aisle. And so above this side aisle, as, as we walk through, and here's the nave. So both weight and thrust are reduced, and then the buttresses carry the weight downward to the outer wall of the aisle. So the ribbed groin vault in the Romanesque uses round arches, dividing each bay with two pairs. And of course, this was perfective in St. Etienne at Cannes, this system of vaulting. Here is Durham Castle, which is an example of a Norman fortress. And we don't have that many, so it's interesting to look at this one. So the only way in and out is over a drawbridge, which is control from a gatehouse. And then beyond the gatehouse is a bailey. So this diagram gives you your castle vocabulary. Here is the keep or the donjon. And the keep, of course, is used for battle. Bishops of Durham lived in a three-story residence. And so I wanted you to at least, you know, this is a detail of the vaulting used at Durham Castle. So again, we have this ribbed vaulting, but of course it's heavy, it's squat, it's built for defense. And here's the exterior stonework at Durham Castle. So just to give you a flavor of what this building looks like. After about 11.30, we have a revival in book illumination. And so this is a quintessential example of this theme of the Hellmouth, which we saw, of course, in the Church of Saint-Lazare in Autun. This is the page with the Hellmouth from the Winchester Psalter, which is created around 1150. And it was produced in a very well-known scriptorium in Winchester. The roots of this style are in the Utrecht Paul Psalter, in the Rheims School. This idea of all of these sort of very sketchy, very animated figures. And here we're seeing the gaping jaws of hell. This hell moth is a very common theme. It says, here is hell and the angels who are locking the door. They're pushing the last of the damned people in. And there were many Hellmouth performances around this time staged with live actors. It was a very popular subject for mystery plays throughout England at the time. So if you remember, here's our detail from the Tympanum and St. Lazare, and then our detail from the Hellmouth Psalter. In your book, there's a art in its context that talks about the role of women in the 12th century. It's very good. And as that article states, for the most part, women are excluded from the intellectual life of European society. And this isn't unique to the 12th century, as you can imagine. Most women didn't have access to an education at all. If you're aristocratic, you could have an education if the men in your family allow it, 
or you could go to a monastery. And if you went to a monastery, you could get educated there. So the women who did go to monasteries often turned to mysticism at this time, which it's a spiritual discipline, mysticism is. It's the, the idea of any type of mysticism, which we have it in Tantric Buddhism, we have it in the study of Brahma in Hinduism, we have it in Zen Buddhism in some ways, um, in the Shinto in Japan, uh, in Islamic, the Sufis, Native American. There's many, many disciplines that have a mystic thread that run through them, and Christianity is no exception. We're going to see this in the Gothic era as well, this blending of mysticism and intellect. So this spiritual union with the divine through meditation or trance-like contemplation was something that was taken up with women, they saw themselves as a vessel, passive vessels, where the divine entity can communicate with the physical world. We'll see this later in Survey 2 in um, images such as Bernini's St. Teresa and Avila. So here is a facsimile of the original manuscript. The original manuscript of this particular book is lost, but we do have copies of it. We see in the Carolingian influences, for example, in from the Utrecht Psalter in the Hellmouth book. And here we also have some Atonian influences and both Carolingian and Atonian manuscripts continue in the Romanesque period. It's these are where the schools were. So these different people take these traditions, they learn, they learn, they graft on their own style. This particular painting is done by a woman named Hildegard. She's Hildegard of Bingen. She was born into a German family. And here she's shown receiving this flash of divine insight, which is that is the story of Hildegard is that she had visions from very early as a child. And in this picture, you can see her scribe Volmar. He's waiting outside while she has this vision. Here's a closer view. So you can see the tongue, the flames entering her head. These are the divine flames of wisdom. There are several different images of her with these divine flames of wisdom. And so even as a child, she had these visions, these shimmering lights, circling stars. And her, her skivias consists, there's 35 visions illustrating the history of salvation. This is the opening page, and Hildegard is describing this vision in which tongues of fire are permeating her brain. And you can see this architectural space is very much like the Etonian manuscripts, that, but this very shallow background, this bold gold background that we've even seen as far back as Byzantine manuscripts. And there's even some patterning here, which we could ascribe to that Byzantine influence as well. Here she is, this is called Strengthening the Soul for the Journey. So um, she wrote many, many other books besides this one. She wrote books on science, books on medicine. She was well-educated and learned. Here are the six days of creation. So it is know the ways of God. Now we're going to look at architecture in Italy during the Romanesque period. So again, this is during the Romanesque period, but it all looks completely different. So is it Romanesque or is it Romanesque period? So I just say we can call this Romanesque Italian or architecture in Romanesque Italy. And it's because, naturally enough, the spirit of ancient Rome is strong here. So and in these Italian sculptures, we have this earliest examples of narrative portal sculpture in Italy. Here in Medina Cathedral, we have subjects from Genesis, from the creation all the way to the flood. There's this long um, facade, these beautiful illustrations. And there's different figures, um, drama, use of gesture. They have their liturgical plays of the period that are reflected here. This is the Church of Sant'Ambrogio in Lombardy, or Northern Italy. So it's begun in 1080, and then the vaulting is added after 1117. So they're using a lot of the earlier 9th century structure, including this freestanding monk's tower that we've seen before. 
But Lombardy really takes the lead in developing a Romanesque style. Much stronger Roman influences here, even influences from Ravenna. So if you look at this vaulting, this is the vaulting in the church of San Ambrogio. This is the gallery vaulting over to the side. And it was rebuilt after an earthquake and with future earthquakes in mind. So they're not going after height. They're going after strength. We have these compound piers, extra supports, so the church isn't going to come crashing down again. So when we look at the nave, it's wider, it's shorter, it's squatter, and we have this four-part rib vaulting and then vaulted galleries that are buttressing the nave, and the windows are only in the outer wall, so it's built for strength. A little bit of history here. The Salian dynasty replaced the Etonians in the early 11th century. So that's, you know, the end of the Etonian Empire. And we've talked about the Holy Roman Empire, which encompassed most of Germany and Langobard, Italy. Henry IV was the third Salian emperor, and he became involved in this whole investiture controversy, which was over the right of lay rulers to, quote unquote, invest high-ranking clergy with symbols of office. So this becomes important because it's about who has the power. So Pope Gregory VII said only the Pope and his bishops could appoint bishops and abbots and other clergy. So people who are on the side of the emperor believe the emperor should have that right. So you can see why this controversy divided Germany and Germany remains divided until the 19th century We've also got fragmentation in Italy. Major cities are all functioning as independent civil entities in competition with each other. We have Pisa and Genoa. Each one's are corporations, self-governing, huge profits. And so the bishops of these respective cities built and furnished cathedrals for these cities. And so it's warfare and controversy, but the cultural traditions remain strong. And we have, I think for many reasons, and some of which come out of that very, very brief history with very few events. And I, again, I encourage you to read about that period because there's so much more information than I can cover with you now. But the point of this is that we have the spirit of classical Rome reappearing at this time. And it has to do with this common thread of culture. And so the Romanesque art of Pisa, Rome, Medina, all these other cities, they have this in common. Pisa is a maritime power, and Pisa is completing with Muslim centers for the Mediterranean trade. So there's so many different factors here that are governing and guiding what these different rulers are doing and the way they're building and the way they're spending their money and who's moving into the various city-states. Builders in Rome want to revive the past because during the investiture con controversy, Rome was destroyed. And Rome is destroyed many, many times over these centuries. And the last one was 1084. So builders are wanting to revive the past now for Rome. So here is the cathedral complex at Pisa. And again, as we've said, we have this whole series of independent city-states and Pisa, Venice, and Genoa are all trade centers. Not only are they competing with the Muslims for Mediterranean trade, they're also transporting pilgrims to the Holy Land. And the pilgrim trade is big, big business as we've already talked about. So each city, wants to draw this business to them. And they all build beautiful cathedrals. So at Pisa, this complex is dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And again, as we've already discussed, the Virgin Mary also is a very important personage in Romanesque times. We had this whole cult of Mariology that has come up from Bernard of Clairvaux and many other reasons. So in Italy, this is a new and different thing. We have different buildings used for different church functions. So here we have from left to right the baptistery and then the cathedral in the middle and then the campanile or bell 
Tower, this famous Leaning Tower of Pisa, which actually began to sink um, almost as soon as it was built. There's a closer view, so you can see what ties them together is this Roman influence on this architectural exterior. You can even think all the way back to the Colosseum, if you will. Now, the cathedral doesn't get completed until the 13th century, but it's an adaptation on the basilica. It's a cruciform basilica, but it's got a long nave, and of course it's got the Romanesque side aisles, and it, in essence it's a pilgrimage church as well. And then the transept itself, each has its own aisles and apse also. The baptistery is in the front of this slide. It's used for baptism, and traditionally baptisteries would have a central plan. So this cylindrical tower for the bell tower, it's a reuse of an ancient classical theme. You can go all the way back to ancient Rome and find examples of this, which is characteristic of Italian Romanesque art, which draws very deeply from the Roman past. Now, of course, in the Northern Romanesque, we've seen Roman influences, and a lot of it has to do with not only looking to the Romans as seats of classical learning, but also practical building methods, the use of the arch the, and the way that the buildings are put together. So here is the plan of the Baptistry Cathedral in Campanile in Pisa. So it's a, you can see the ground plan, the baptistry, and then the cathedral. You can see the side aisles. Very, very simple. Each part is extremely simple. It's just a cruciform Latin cross. And each arm of the transept is like its own little basilica. What ties it together is the exterior architectural elements on all three buildings. Here's what it looks like inside the cathedral. Little bit taller proportions than early Christian basilicas because there's galleries over the aisles and a clear story. But note the classical columns here. This is very different from what we've seen in the Ro Northern Romanesque. We don't have this alternation of piers, columns, piers, columns. It's just this simple rhythm of classical columns, two colonnades. This is the Church of San Clemente, which was, again, it was rebuilt after burning to the ground during the investiture controversy. And again, it's another reflection of this effort to reclaim this artistic leg legacy, the spiritual legacy of the church. So this is in Rome. And these Italian Romanesque, these rectangular plans, they interrupt the line of these Ionic columns, very classical Ionic form here. We had the Corinthian form in the previous cathedral. Now, San Clemente does use mosaic, but it's a rare exception. And that concludes our study of Romanesque art. And next time we will study Gothic art and that will conclude the semester.